Uh, my name is Carlos Jensen. I'm from Oregon State University. Um, originally, my grad student, Suresh, was supposed to present this work, but he's uh, uh, having visa issues, so I'm kind of stepping in. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't ask me any other hard questions, but if you ask me anything about the implementation of the tool itself, then I might go, ooh, and uh, mm. So uh, anything about the study, I'm, I'm, I'm good with. Um, all right, so we're looking at primarily uh, search for the purpose of refining information on your desktop. So we're talking about desktop search. And here's basically the problem statement that we start with. Computers are increasingly, at least in my opinion, becoming black holes for information. Storage uh, density is increasing, storage prices are decreasing, we're increasingly collaborating with each other, uh, we increasingly have cloud-based uh, file sharing services, etc. All the incentives that we had before for carefully filtering, sorting, and archiving information are to a certain extent disappearing before our eyes. And in fact, the software that we're using increasingly uh, encourages us to save multiple versions of, of a document. And this is essentially bringing about this problem. The more information we have, the harder it is to refine anything on our computer. So if I do a keyword search on my laptop for provenance, I get several hundred hits. Now, how is this affecting our ability to refine information? Well, we know that the most popular way for users to refine any information is to carefully organize uh, information into files and folders. Um, and to a certain extent, I mean, the more information you have, the more folders you're gonna, you're gonna need. As we start collaborating and as the kind of boundary between projects blurs, finding the right location, the right resource in the right location becomes difficult. And this is especially true for knowledge workers who basically depend on being able to refine all and reuse information from previous projects or previous uh, uh, reports. The alternative, of course, is keyword search. In keyword search for especially knowledge workers breaks down surprisingly quickly. You're working in a relatively narrow domain. You keep using the same terminology. You keep citing the same papers over and over again. How are you going to find a unique enough keyword that you can refine the document you have in mind quickly and easily? What most of us end up with is a long list of possible hits, and then we've got to manually sort through that, opening up various documents or relying on things like uh, folder location or, or um, last change date as a way of kind of finalizing the, the query. So we started thinking about the possibility of using provenance, the history of a document, how a document was used, moved, renamed, um, built, where information has gone to, as an additional set of cues in doing search. And we wanted to see whether this was really feasible, especially for knowledge workers. Um, we've got some previous research here that shows that people do remember related documents to those that, that they're searching for. Um, and this is something that computers, in theory, should be really, really good at. Okay? There's no really technical barrier to tracking all the transformation and all the interactions that we have with our files, with our websites, with our emails. It's just that we're not doing it, and we don't really have an effective model for using that in search. Okay? The other reason why we want to get into this research is that using provenance allows you to basically formulate fundamentally different searches from what you can do with a keyword search. I can talk about the context under which this document was developed or written, as opposed to the content of the document. So we set up with a fairly ambitious research goal, long, long time ago. This has been a very long project. Um, we wanted to study how, especially knowledge workers, use uh, and reuse information in the real world. We wanted to see whether provenance cues could be effective in search environments. 
And then we wanted to develop tools that would leverage provenance if it turned out that this was actually useful and, and uh, common enough and all that kind of stuff. And so all the way back in 2008, we started collecting data. We did a uh, three-month study at Intel where we tracked people's use and access to files, collaboration with each other via email, all that kind of stuff. We installed a basically logging software on their computers. And uh, of course, threw in the necessary safeguards here that they could disable for privacy reasons. We had to clean the data afterwards for proprietary information. You can imagine all the usual things you have to do when you're studying people doing actual work. Um, and what we were essentially trying to do, instead of recording the files, we were really trying to record the relationship between files. And this was published in, in CHI 2010. So uh, I'm just going to skip through this so that you have context for what we're going to do next. We had 17 information workers who contributed at least five weeks of data, uh, five weeks of, of use. Uh, the average was 43 working days. Um, in addition to basically gathering these data logs, we also went and we observed uh, nine of these information workers for a whole day to see what other information flows there were outside of the computer system. Uh, and then we did exit interviews where we uh, presented to them some files or we asked them to find the file that they were working on a specific day and uh, presented them with provenance information to see if they could recall some more information. Overall, we tracked uh, our subjects using 126,000 files, emails, websites, uh, et cetera, for an average of about 7,500 resources per user. And there was a fair range there. Uh, a lot of these turned out to be uh, websites. Um, and there's a little asterisk there because Intel does a lot of their internal processes through an intranet website, and we didn't disambiguate between external and internal websites. So a lot of this is reporting, uh, finding out how to book travel, how to do this, that, or the other. Um, and then if we'd split it up into intranet versus external net, uh, probably the top category here would have been email. Intel is a very email-centric company. Um, Intel is a very Microsoft Office-centric company. Um, we also looked at what kind of provenance events occurred between these kinds of, of uh, resources. Uh, and by far, the most common, almost two-thirds of all events, were copy-paste type events. People were copying and pasting either from documents into websites, into emails, from emails into websites, from one document to another, et cetera. And 15% of them were save as, so basically versioning. All the others were important, but they were relatively rare compared to the other, the, the other two events. What we did find was that people reuse information all the time. This is a really common and important practice. 53% of all files and emails and websites had at least a link to at least one other uh, resource on their websites. And we didn't track work groups, so this is kind of a lower bound. We know that most of them were working on teams, and we kind of got cut off uh, at the team boundary. Um, and their resources form these complex kind of graphs of influence, graphs of reuse, which you call provenance graphs. Um, and the average size of a provenance graph was 5.8 resources. Um, some fairly, fairly large ones. Um, in addition, what we found was that showing people a visualization of their workflow or how uh, a document had been developed helped them recall uh, significantly more information about what had taken place. They recovered a lot of context. They recovered a lot of, of information. So they found these graphs that I showed just a second ago highly intuitive. None of them had any problems understanding what was going on. Uh, and, and they all immediately started delving in here, even though some of them argued whether we got it right or not. So now that we know that provenance, reuse, et cetera, is a very, very common and very important practice, 
can we use provenance more actively? We're far from the first people to have looked at using provenance in search. Okay? Many, many systems. But most of them include provenance as an addition to keyword search. So you can add to you know, your regular keyword search uh, in an email from blah. Okay? And it basically becomes part of the query. Um, that's not necessarily bad. We just wanted to try to do something differently. Um, the only, and then there's a more thorough review of the related work in our paper, and should be up very, very soon. Um, the only example that we'd seen of a more visual treatment of provenance in search is a system called Feldspar, developed by CMU uh, and published at CHI in 2008, where you essentially do uh, provenance as a kind of flowchart mechanism. I'm looking for an email that was related to an event, which is da 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 da, da. and you kind of create this uh, path through the different conditions. But what if we could ask people to draw queries? Would that be something that's actually useful? Would that be something that's actually feasible to do? We know that the, our users uh, from the previous study actually liked doing these kinds of things. So um, we needed to figure out what does it mean in terms of efficiency to actually draw out a query. A query using only provenance, worst case scenario. Um, how complicated a query would that be? In order to, to, to answer that question, you basically need to find every unique walk through these provenance graphs. And then you need to find the longest duplicate that you can in those walks. Okay? That is the worst case scenario where you have a ambiguous query, a query that will return two hits. Okay? And so your worst case query is going to be equal to longest path plus one. That's the additional bit that you need to disambiguate. Um, we also wanted to look at whether remembering what kind of relationship there was between these files made a difference. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Given that 63% of all provenance events were copy-paste, how much power do you lose if you just forget about saying what kind of relationship is this and just say uh, uh, an email that went to Word that went to blah. So keep in mind, uh, this was an analysis based on an average repository with 7,500 items in it. Um, and what we found was that the average graphical query was actually remarkably short. Depending on how people like to work, there are people who do a lot of versioning, for instance. There are people who do a lot of copy-paste. There are other people who work in a document until they're, very, they're, they're done and then only then hit save. So there's obviously a lot of uh, differences in work style. But the median here was four and a half items without specifying what kind of provenance or what kind of link there is between uh, two resources will give you a unique result. And as we kind of suspected, not bothering with what kind of link there was between resources didn't actually do very much to uh, complicate the query. And again, part of the reason was that the longest chains tended to be the ones that had a lot of copy-paste, copy-paste going back and forth. The more important thing was that the complexity of the query grows linearly about one node per 200 links, according to our data. Okay? So a fairly gentle slope in terms of increasing complexity. So with that, I asked my student to do this analysis before I let him go out and build a prototype because uh, I got burned on really cool ideas before that then turned out to be not so good ideas. Um, and being an HCI person, I said, this looks really cool. Go out and do it. Uh, and if I had actually studied my uh, algorithms, uh, I would have known that this is uh, actually an NP-complete problem, the subgrab isomorphism problem. Uh, but some really smart people in 2007 published a G-Ray uh, algorithm which allows you to um, do fuzzy matching. So if you're not strict about the matching, if you can allow for uh, potential uh, nodes in between, then you can do this actually very, very efficiently. So we built a system. Um, 
that monitored a whole bunch of different applications and resources. Uh, and then we built a query interface that, that kind of mines it. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm going to not do the demo. I'm going to hold the demo until the very end uh, in case I run out of time. Um, but you basically see here a query composition window. Clicking on the window lets you immediately place an item on, on the canvas. You can select the type. You drag a link between the two. Um, and then you hit the search button, and different possible alternatives show up here. Once you've done that, uh, then you can uh, do some exploration to see if you've gotten the right one. I am going to change my mind and actually do the video. Um, okay. So click on any white space, and you can choose what kind of file. Drag and drop this way. We automatically set the provenance type by what the most likely relationship between these two uh, would be from our statistical study. I have to slow the video down because my student did it in really high speed, and this actually goes a lot quicker. But now you see possible matches down here. And you can select one and actually explore it. Um, this shows a simplified view, just highlighting the elements that he thinks are related. And here's a complete view of every link that goes into these documents um, so that you can verify, really, whether this was the right link or not. And of course, tooltips will tell you um, more information about the different documents. All right. Uh, in addition, we wanted to support exploration. So we actually added this feature to uh, Windows Explorer where you could click on a, right click on a file and see the provenance graph for that file, even if you weren't searching. You just wanted to learn or recall some more about the file. So we did a, a preliminary evaluation. We, by, from the time we collected the data until the time we were ready to test the prototypes, our friends at Intel had gone through about a half a dozen reorgs. And we no longer had access to our subjects, and we no longer had access to our, our uh, uh, co-PI. Um, so we had to basically recreate uh, data representative of what we'd found in the Intel study. And then we did a preliminary evaluation with grad students. The goal here is to iron out the worst of the kinks before we do another three to six month deployment study with real people, real data. Uh, so what they did, they went through an interactive tutorial. Uh, they went through an experimental task where we asked them to find nine different resources in a database, uh, sorry, a file system that we'd created. Um, and there were more than one way of specifying any query, and half the queries, at least half the queries, had one, more than one potential correct result or hit. Um, and then we arbitrarily set a cutoff time at two minutes saying, well, that sounds reasonable to us. Um, which turned out not to be such a good idea. Uh, and then we interviewed the participants afterwards. So what do we find? The average completion time uh, for doing a query, actually composing it, evaluating it, finding the right result is about 106 seconds, which if you look at any non-keyword search system is actually fairly good. Um, and we're actually better than uh, Feldspar. Uh, for simple tasks, obviously, it was simpler. For harder tasks, it was harder. This is where that setting the two-minute arbitrary cutoff point was a really dumb idea. Uh, we probably should have had one for easy tasks and one for hard tasks. Um, but the queries that they had to do to find any resource in this database that was representative of what we found in Intel, um, they only needed to draw about 2.8 uh, nodes and two edges on average. Um, we had a lot of uh, observations, which I have no time to cover. Uh, but they really liked the tool. Obviously, you know, take it for what it's worth. These are not people who are working with their own data. Um, but they were very positive to it. They learned very quickly how to use it. Our training period turned out not to be long enough. There was a significant uh, learning occurring even afterwards. But we'd randomized the conditions, so that should be OK. Um, and they pointed out a whole bunch of areas for improvement. So kind of our conclusions, um, provenance events are very common. We should be leveraging them, whether it's through this system or through something else. But they're there. People actually remember them. People want to talk about their files using this vocabulary. Um, 
using provenance alone, you know, it's never going to replace keyword search. But for certain types of queries, certain types of uh, exploration tasks, it's probably better than keyword. Um, and a graphical sketchpad actually works. Hey, who knew? Um, and, and it was very easy to learn. So the next steps, um, we're going to refine the prototype. Uh, we're going to expand it with some of the additional features that, that people ask for. Uh, possibly support something that isn't Windows because I don't use Windows anymore. Um, and then get ready for a longitudinal study. And what we're really looking for here is how do people adapt to the use of Leyline. It takes a while for people to actually get used to the fact that we're tracking how the files are used, that this information is available. Um, and obviously when we're doing a study like this, the system isn't really useful until we've been tracking information for quite a while. Um, scalability issues from our earlier data, we think we're OK, but we won't know until we're actually there. Um, can we really use this for exploration? I think that's the most exciting part here, that you can really get to know uh, things. And, and how does Leyline fit into work groups? because I can actually successfully search a, a file system having only a vague idea of how a file was, uh, was developed. I know it was by, you know, John worked on it. I know we emailed back and forth about it. And I know uh, it was related to this event. Find possible candidates. It's something you can't do with keyword search. And like I said, uh, Intel, bless their hearts, uh, wonderful partners. Uh, but we're looking for uh, new partners, uh, new volunteers, uh, victims, et cetera. Um, so thanks, Intel, for the initial funding. And if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to email either Sarush or myself, and we'll be happy to answer them.